you know, I'm always especially proud of our young people at High School for Recording Arts. So SK, Kenyatta, and Wisdom, they and their incredible video, Tossed Up, on um, Tossed Up. I mean, you know, what a great opportunity for them to be a part of this space, demonstrating their brilliance. And then also, you know, Sarah Fine and, and her unpacking. It was just incredible. What did you think, Mike? I thought it was an unbelievable series, and it's a hard act to follow. So I'm hoping we can uh, live up to the <laughs> expectations today. Absolutely. And then next week, next week, next week, we have Carlos and Alexis. Mm. They're going to bring it. But you know, with that, I just want to again thank Field and International for being an incredible partner, Nathan, Randy, your whole team. Um, it's beautiful. So, you know, we're here today to continue this conversation around equity. And um, when I think about my life work in terms of equity, I think about equity truly at its deepest point. We hear a lot of words around equity, but I really think about it beyond the words. Because for me, there's this tension, there's this great point of tension when it comes to the young people that I serve, quite frankly. And can we be equitable and provide equity and recognize that in order to do so, we have to be very conscious and aware of matters related to social and racial justice. So for me, in terms of that aspect of equity and recognizing that it's hardest being reached at young people who are black, brown, indigenous, who are particularly poor, may not have opportunities of privilege that some might. And that's what my life work has been about. And that's what Michael and I are going to share with you about our respective stories, as well as how we come together in the work that we do at High School for Recording Arts. Because just like you may have heard from High Tech High, that High Tech High is a equity project. High School for Recording Arts is not a trade school, it's an equity project with a particular focus around social and racial justice. Just like High Tech High is not a coding school, it's an equity project. And it's so important for us to un understand that what we're talking about was brilliantly captured when Nathan shared um, you know, the, the mission from the school, um, Sister Amanda Gorman attended. So, you know, again, thinking about equity and thinking about it the fact that for young people who don't have that, the ability to have issues related to their needs, because that's what it's really about, focusing on their needs that, may, that might be provided if their parents may have some means and able to really um, fill in those gaps. But when the, what happens if those gaps can't be filled? What happens if they're in a space and in a condition and in a, in a community where um, the school really is driving that. So for me, when I think about all of that, I think about how I grew up, coming out of hip hop culture, growing up in New York in the 1970s, where you know there was no more uh, money for school arts programs and, and, and things just seemed to be falling apart around communities, especially the most vulnerable com communities. And out of that rose this incredible culture of hip hop. And I think about the fact that those young people found something in themselves to, to bring forth their needs and really um, demonstrating to the world of what their brilliance was. And so, so taking that and then thinking about our school, High School for Recording Arts, which, which was created in the 90s, still after hip hop in the 70s, where those equity needs were still there and seeing it manifested in the young people who were showing up at our recording studio every day, but not in school. School had pushed, kicked them out. They couldn't, they couldn't relate to how these young people were showing up, who they were, their essence. And yet, even to this day, where we see that despite the 20 years of work we've done across the nation, so many young people that again look like whom we serve are falling through the cracks. I see it most clearly when I think about the 5 million young people at any given day who are pushed or kicked out of school, not in school, not, in, not employed. That is what drives my thinking. That's what drives the work that we do in terms of high school for recording arts. So we're using hip hop 
kind of as a backdrop and and for really the framing of our conversation. And Mike, why don't you read the quote that we have on the screen and, and provide a little context and then I'm gonna segue in one last time before you start with our points. Sure. Sure, sure. So thank you, Tony. Hello, everybody. It's a, a pleasure to be here. My name is Michael Lipset. I am the Director of Social Impact at the High School for Recording Arts. I'm also a course lecturer at McGill University in the Department of Education. Uh, I'm going to be bringing some more theoretical level contributions uh, to our conversation today and want to offer this quote to begin our chat. Um, thank you, Tony, for that amazing introduction. So this comes from Christopher Emden, who many of you may know, an associate professor at Teachers College at Columbia University. It says, when a student is brilliant on the street corner, but falling asleep in class, something is wrong with the schooling system. It's one of Tony and I's favorite quotes. And Tony, I want to pass it back to you to talk a little bit about why. Yeah, so, you know, we're using Chris, uh, uh, Christopher Wallace as a focal point of what we mean about really getting to that greatest tension point. You know, we know that Christopher Wallace as a hip hop artist growing up in Brooklyn, New York was sucked in by street life and culture. And he wrote a song called the 10 Crack Commandments. And that song was really him giving voice in a lyrical fashion to the life that had taken him in. And in a very real way, um, just like I've been hearing about Amanda Gorman and, and people say, how do who what other Amanda Gormans are we missing in our schools? I say what other Biggie Smalls are we missing in the schools as well? And when we when we think about that question, we think about it in the sense that we have a lot that we can learn from the Amanda Gormans as well as the Biggies. So we're using as a backdrop to our conversation the Ten Crack Commandments, except we're gonna give it another name. We're gonna call it the 10 Equity Commandments. And we're gonna use the guidance that Biggie brilliantly brought to us in terms of, of, of introducing that when he talks about it being that these were the rules of the street life, that he wrote himself a manual, a step-by-step -step booklet to keep your game on track. In a sense, Biggie, was providing a TED talk to the hood. And in, in that sense, we wanna use that again as a backdrop. And we wanna talk about what we have learned, what we have experienced over 10 years, what we feel is a guide towards thinking about equity at its greatest tension point. And the beauty of it is, if we get it right for the biggie smalls, we're gonna be able to get it right for every young person because every young person deserves equity and to be aware and conscious and a fighter for racial and social justice. So with that, let's go to number one. All right, so Tony and I are gonna do this together. We've got 10 commandments and we're each gonna take five. The first is issue no commandments. And we say this because in order to do the radical work of designing liberatory and not simply equitable learning spaces, we must recognize the fundamental necessity to break down binary ways of thinking and being. In this way, though we've curated these 10 commandments, we also recognize that to issue a commandment is to neglect the depth of nuance necessary to do the radical transformative work of the liberatory education for all students. At HSRA, this means personalized learning that is teacher powered. These two elements make each learner's educational journey unique to them and each teacher's response empowered to meet the needs of each student. Which brings us to our second commandment. And that is that the who impacts the what and the how. Uh, I'm gonna pause here quickly. Nathan, if you wanna take over those slides and drop that as a, as a full screen thing, that, that would be great. I'm gonna keep going um, while you all sort that out. So the second commandment, um, not only does the who of the student impact what and how they learn, but the who of the teacher, the school leader, the superintendent, and so on and so forth. When we had successfully raised the funds to open a new high school for recording arts in Los Angeles, Tony and TC were gracious and kind enough to ask me to be the school leader. 
I was hesitant because I'm a cis white man from Minnesota. I didn't know LA well, I don't speak Spanish. And I valued at least those characteristics in our new school leader. What they knew then, but I only learned later was that who you are will help determine what you do as an educator and how you do it. While I wasn't able to speak with my students and their parents in Spanish, I was able to contribute to the growth of the organization in other ways that were authentic to my ability and social location. For many reasons, working in a classroom or a recording studio hands-on with the students is actually the least appropriate place for me to be. School leadership makes more sense given my positionality since I have a network I can leverage on behalf of an institution, but more logically, I now serve as the director of social impact at HSRA, engaging in fundraising, research, and the development of our new nonprofit for learning, which provides counseling and coaching for educators interested in learning from our journey. So to the white educators on this call, you might be wondering how to ensure the proper use of your power and privilege that comes with your race. This is not a question anyone can answer for you and does not have a singular answer. I say do the reading and do the knowledge, but I will also say that to operate in a socially just manner for anyone does not require that you shrink or divest yourself of what you have, but to use what you have, whether it be privilege or creativity or otherwise, in ethical, equitable, liberatory, and socially just ways. Thank you, Michael. So let's move to number three. Except you were not in the plan. I think I realized that as a young African-American boy growing up in Brooklyn, New York by first grade. I couldn't articulate it, but I knew that the culture and experience that I had in my neighborhood, in my home, was different than what I was experiencing in my New York City public school. And that there was a disconnect. And the first time that I began to see some light at the end of the tunnel was when, for the very first time in the third grade, middle of third grade, uh, my teacher introduced this tall, handsome African-American male who was gonna be our music teacher and brought in a cardboard box of plastic flutophones for us to um, express our creativity. And from that point on, my only connection really to school, even though I was a compliant kid, I always did the right thing, was that expression, that self-expression. I knew enough and I had the support in my family enough to do enough to get by and even excel in some areas, but I didn't feel it. And I think that when I personally saw the young people coming to high school for recording arts and hearing their stories of disconnection. I knew intuitively, even though I probably couldn't articulate it then, that what they were saying was true. The system wasn't designed for them. And from that, you realize that if you're going to do this work to engage them, disruption, despite being a creative, disruption is what you have to um, feel in your bones and you have to have as the driving force because how else can you really make sense of this if the plan, if the system isn't designed? You have to create something new. And four, find your truth. Never stop exploring it. Even in that quest and even in terms of figuring out that something's wrong and something new needs to come about for these young people who look like me, I have to do my own, my own self-inventory, my own exploration, my own going back to my ancestors and figuring out how do they deal with the same kind of battles and fights and figuring out my, even my own biases. The fact that I grew up with two parents, loving parents, working class, but a lot of the young people that I'm working with never had that and that I, have to, I come with certain biases too. So doing that deep exploration and understanding that you know, my journey is a part of their journey, that journey connects us on a human level. So I don't see them as the other, I see them as me, irrespective of race, irrespective of class. So Michael? Tony, I appreciate your, your recognition there. Uh, it segues nicely into number five, which is that we are problematic. This is our gift. In a world where, except for our indigenous and Latinx family, whose territory is now referred to as the United States, 
we're all here under false pretenses. Whether we chose to come or our families were forcibly brought here, uh, almost everything we do is laced with a colonial white supremacist presence. And in that vein, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that wherever we are, we're likely tuning in, unless we're uh, international or otherwise, from what was a traditional indigenous territory. I would normally be uh, zooming in from the Ghanaian Gahaga Mohawk territory. I want to acknowledge that we are on generally stolen land. Um, and with that, I will move on and, and continue with number five to say that uh, whether we're white, black, brown, able-bodied, cisgendered, neurotypical, first language speakers and beyond, we each have unique problematic components to our identity in relation to the other. Personally, as a white person, and for those listening, I recognize that in this moment, I am centering whiteness. I do so because I bring the only representation of whiteness in this series, and because I think, given the whiteness of the education profession, it's important to address whiteness and white educators directly. So I'll say that as a white person, particularly one in my body, um, a white Jewish man, uh, a white man of Jewish descent in a middle class upbringing, I recognize I hold almost every form of privilege possible in the context of the US and many parts of the world. And this means establishing and maintaining a critical sense of humility among other things. But each of these characteristics cross cut with language in certain contexts as well, confer power and privilege in different ways upon each of us. So the question is not, am I problematic? It's who am I? How am I problematic? And what will I do now that I've recognized my personal location in this fight that implicates us all? Well, again, great segue to number six, Michael. Co-design space for truth and freedom. Accept all, then believe what you see. So for us, in that disruption and, 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 and recognizing our own selves as, as we see our young people, um, how do we then allow them to come as, as they are authentically? Even if they come raw, even if they come from a, a, a background and, and a predisposition that may work against our own particular values or our own comfort. In a, in a very real sense, what we're doing in our space is that we're creating a space. We're creating the opportunity for our young people to experience the act of being free. When so many of the young people we engage with, again, black, brown, indigenous bodies are controlled and want to be put in, 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 in structured environments out of fear, out of discomfort, our attitude is to break that absolutely, totally down, to give them that sense of freedom. So, you know, one thing I think about, we spoke again of Amanda Gorman, who I and my daughter absolutely love. I mean, we, we, we watched her multiple times. But then I also think about the other poet again, Christopher Wallace, Biggie Smalls. What if he showed up to the schoolhouse doors with all of the attitude, the look, the lived experience of say, a young Latinx man who has been taken to the streets. How much do we feel you must strip away of all of that to finally feel comfortable engaging with him or her? So, you know, I wanna put it in another context other than just Biggie. We're about to hear from Living School and I did a little virtual snooping because I love their school. And a young man there, Stefan, of yours named Jerome, wrote this poem, let me read it. Living school is my school, a place where we go to learn, not just learn by doing, we also do earning. For things we want and need to succeed, living school helps students meet their needs. We don't all start off green, but sooner or later with living school, we all succeed. With the moon shining and the sun rising, teachers still at work around the clock, on the dot, the grind don't stop. I chose living school because I know that I will be bigger and better at what I chose to be than I would be at other schools that don't really appreciate me or my fellow friends. This is this a poem for my teachers and the staff of living school, my school. Michael. 
Wow. Uh, I mean, first, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I would just ask in response, you know, when we think about stripping students of those parts of themselves that rub us as educators the wrong way, we also have to ask what magic are we trying to snuff out? What beauty are we trying to fit into our box as opposed to understanding, you know, what their true potential might be? So number seven says the work is never finished and spans sp space and time. Alim and Paris practitioners and developers of culturally sustaining revitalizing pedagogy point out the necessity for educators to not just sustain, but revitalize those elements of student culture that have resisted marginalization over time. Do the legacy of your ancestors hold secrets for how you might resist the marginalization and subjugation of your students' cultures in the classroom or in the schoolhouse? And what elements of your student, students' cultures should they be learning in order to better understand how to resist the ever-present pressures of oppression and marginalization? And recall that the systemic function of white supremacy in particular impacts people based on race, gender, and socioeconomic status. So to refer to it is not to reduce our challenges to race, but to complicate them in an intersectional feminist way. This is the work that never finishes. It's the work of maintaining a critical reflexivity which must be active so that when we stop acting, we begin flowing with the tide of the status quo. And that tide is the tide of oppression. As soon as our students start to learn about who they are, what beauty their pasts hold, how these histories inform their current identities and realities, they begin seeing themselves in the classroom and in their learning and in the adults guiding them. Which brings me to number eight. And that is dynamics always shift. So we must always learn. In the sense that oppression and marginalization are the status quo today, we have to have hope that we're working for a new status quo where the opposite is true. The dynamic, nuanced, non-binary lens required to actively deconstruct our world as educators and our students' world as learners requires a keen attention to the very subtle ways in which the world around us and them continues to ebb, flow, and change. What ideas we had for today may not hold water tomorrow. When HSRA opened up, it was so far ahead of its time that only today are more schools catching on to the competency-based curriculum, personalized learning plans, advisory model, project-based learning, internship-based 21st century skills training program that we've been cultivating over the last 20 plus years. Now that more and more people are waking up to these best practices, we have to keep focusing on our own reinvention and remix ourselves to match the needs of the world around us. Throughout the pandemic, our at-home learning kits for deeper project-based learning and our job squad internship program have been two such initiative, uh, two such innovative responses, we believe, to the pandemic that we're particularly proud of and would love to uh, touch base with anyone interested in learning more about those. Thank you. So we're at the, our last two. So number nine, don't sleep on nothing. I'm purposely using that vernacular to connect again to the culture that, you know, hip hop and, 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 and a lot of the young people we come from and myself, you know, we, we connect with. We know intuitively in our bones what that means. And what I mean by it in this particular context is that we must realize as we're disrupting and creating and we're, and we're providing liberatory space for our young people who are at the furthest margins of, of, of the needs, equity needs that we're talking about, we realize that there are little things that can pull you away from what you're trying to do when you're in the business of, of creating and, and operating schools. You got to pay attention to everything. The system still is there, still designed for you not to succeed. And if you're not doing and uh, what uh, Dr. Wayne Jennings, who was my first mentor in this in, in this way of thinking, told me in his writing and, and verbally about comprehensive change, that you can't just be into teaching, but you're not paying attention to the budget, you're not paying attention to the the, the conditions of your facility. You're not a paying, paying attention to the governance aspects and the community building and, and giving them voice and, and, and a place in, in the work that you're doing. You literally have to be sweating the small stuff. 
is literally about that every single day and always be hyper vigilant on what might cause you to move away from doing the things you need to do for your young people. So last, we're gonna end with how any conversation about equity, social and racial justice should end and that's on love. Love is the last word. Love the journey. If, if you don't understand how hard this work is and how many sleepless nights you might have and how many frustrating moments you might have and, the, and you see the stories of your young people and you understand that each and every one of them deserve your best, again, irrespective of race. But if they come with a story that just tears at your heart, it just makes you feel, how are you gonna continue to do this? If you're not still loving it, loving the journey, you probably, you shouldn't be doing this work. You gotta love it. We gotta love each other. We gotta love you know, the, the process of this struggle. And with that, I just want to thank you all. I can't believe we pretty much did this within a half hour, but we did, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> we were close. And, um, and, and thank you. We, you know, this is an ongoing conversation, and we're deeply appreciative of everyone's intention and look forward to the, to the conversations in the breakout rooms. But um, thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.